Hello, I'm JW. This time we're going to have a look at electricity and more specifically where electricity actually comes from. Now, of course, this will be covering the UK only. Other countries, of course, will be completely different. So it's going to be really where electricity is generated, what's used to generate it, and most importantly, how it's actually changed over the last uh, two or three decades from what we were doing, say, 20, 30 years ago to what things are doing now and where that's likely to go in the future. And we'll also have a look at sort of general capacity, what's available, and how that might impact things like electric vehicle charging. Now, electricity in the UK is supplied from a central electricity grid. There was only one which covers the whole of the UK. That's called the National Grid, and it's also supplied by a company called the same thing. So although there's lots of individual generating stations of various sources of electricity, they all feed into the same grid, and that's the same one that covers so the whole of the UK. Now, this particular illustration here, which uh, covers approximately 30 years, on the left there we've got 1990, and then it goes through uh, through all the decades there up to 2018 in the case of this one, so, so pretty much the uh, present day. And this is the electricity supplied by fuel type. So in other words, what type of fuel was used to actually generate the electricity? And of course, it also shows the total demand as well on the uh, top there, so the total amount of electricity which was generated. And another important point there is that the amount of electricity generated has to match the electricity that's actually used because there isn't really any storage in the national grid. So if demand increases, then generation has to increase at the same time. And conversely, if demand falls, then generation has to be reduced as well. Now, there's not a huge amount of detail on this particular illustration, but it does give us a sort of point about the main sources. So if we look up here on the left-hand side, you can see that in 1990, the vast majority of electricity was created by this grey source here. And we see in the list here, that is coal. So coal was a very big source of electricity, sort of roughly two-thirds or so back then. Nuclear power at the bottom there in purple, and then the rest of it was basically other things, which is basically importing it from other countries, various things like a bit of hydroelectricity and all kinds of other irrelevant little tiny sources. Renewables did exist, but it was that tiny little piece right on the top there, so pretty much uh, insignificant and not even worth looking at. And if we move forward to sort of 2018, which is over 30 years later, the main change is that coal has gone from being the number one provider of electricity down to almost nothing. And the thing that's filled in that gap is this green, which again has gone from nothing over here in the early 1990s to uh, over here. And again, it's a very large chunk of electricity generation. And the green thing, despite its green colour, is gas. And specifically, that's natural gas. So the main change over the last 30 years is we've gone from primarily using coal as a generation source to using natural gas. Now, natural gas is certainly better than coal because it's certainly cleaner when it's burned, but of course it is still a fossil fuel, so it's certainly not ideal. Along the bottom there in purple, nuclear power hasn't really changed much. It's sort of fairly consistent uh, across the bottom there. And again, the others is, again, fairly consistent. There are no massive changes. Now, the other big change, of course, is up here in this yellow and blue. And this is uh, other renewables in the blue, wind and solar in the yellow. So that has increased dramatically from pretty much nothing 30 years ago to fairly substantial amount there. That's about a quarter on this particular graph. And as we'll see later, it has actually increased significantly since then and continues to do so. So the real point we get from this is that despite what certain ragbag newspapers might claim, the fact that we're not using any coal anymore is not due to the fact we've got lots of windmills and uh, solar panels and whatever. It's mainly due to the fact that we've just built a load of gas power stations which have replaced the old coal ones. And we simply don't use coal anymore because there aren't really any coal stations left. So even if you wanted to, coal generation really isn't an option anymore. Before we move on, the other main thing from this particular diagram is the total amount of electricity used. So as you can see here, it sort of increased from 1990 fairly steadily up to around 2005, sort of in the middle of this. But since 2005, the amount of electricity generated and therefore used has actually declined. This is mainly due to increasing efficiency of equipment, to things like lighting, whatever. I think back then it was all incandescent lighting, whereas today, of course, it's pretty much all LED. So although we are obviously having a lot more electrical equipment around and using a lot more electrical stuff, the total amount of electricity we're using has actually fallen. That may be significant when we look at uh, where things like electric cars are going to be powered from a bit later on. 
Now nuclear power along the bottom, as you can see, it's fairly consistent there, it sort of goes up and down a bit, but uh, no real change there. So if we actually have a look at where nuclear power comes from, we can see this uh, list here. This is a list of nuclear reactors in the UK. This is pretty much up to date as of today in sort of 2020. And this goes up to, uh, say, 2019, so just sort of last year. And we see that it's about 15% of uh, generation in the UK is from nuclear power. And uh, we can see again here that back in the 1970s, there was very little. It sort of ramped up, peaked around the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. And since then, it has actually fallen away quite considerably. And the reason for this is that a considerable number of the nuclear reactors in the UK are very old, and they've either closed already or will be closing very shortly, because most of what we have left is, in fact, end of life. Now, if you have a look at this list here, this is a list of all of the nuclear reactors in the UK that are currently still operating. And we can see that uh, various sites down the side here, in most cases, have several units involved there. So Dungeness is uh, B1 and B2, and uh, things like Haysham have got actually four there, A1, A2, B1 and B2. So there isn't actually that many of them left. And if you look down the list here, we can see that some of them are actually basically switched off, although they still exist, they're no longer generating. And in fact, these ones here, say Dungeness, actually uses electricity now rather than generates it. So it's actually taking energy away from the system. But of course, although it's not generating, the whole site still needs power to actually operate and uh, keep running. You can't just turn off a nuclear reactor and then forget it existed. Of course, getting rid of them is a very expensive and energy intensive process. And if we look down the list of the ones that are still operating, we can see here when they were first actually connected to the grid and basically started generating, some here in the 1980s, which is basically Hartlepool and Haysham. Hinkley Point B, which is uh, from the 1970s or 1976, so well over 40 years old. Sizewell is about the newest one from 95, and then a couple there, say, from uh, 98. So most of these reactors are 40 plus years old. They pretty much end of life, and though they're still generating, they're not going to be doing so for very much longer. You can see in this column here the actual capacity that they have in uh, megawatts and uh, size will be being the biggest there. The others relatively small in terms of uh, total generation there. It's around sort of half a uh, gigawatt there. So quite a few of them, but nothing uh, desperately significant. Now, most of these are actually marked for closure within the next decade or so. So some are already under that uh, process. And uh, what's under construction at the moment? Well, basically, there's only one, which is Hinkley Point. Hinkley Point consists of two units, C1 and C2. Construction started a couple of years ago there, 2018 and 2019. And uh, these are a decent size, 1630. So both of those units will be by far the biggest nuclear source in the UK in terms of electricity compared to the others. However, these are only just under construction now. Assuming it's all on time or whatever else, it's going to be another five, six years or so before these things actually start generating. So, of course, we're looking at 2025, 2026 there. And that's the only one that's currently under construction. There is some talk of another one being built at Sizewell, but that's not even been confirmed yet, and uh, that may or may not happen, even if it did tomorrow. And we're looking at another decade or so before that actually got into generation. And then this extensive list here is all the nuclear reactors in the UK which did exist, and have now closed and of course are no longer generating anything and we can see down the side here the permanent shutdown date a substantial number of these closed in the sort of late 90s early 2000s there and load of 2000s there 1990 89 mid 90s there and 2015 2012 so huge amounts of these have already gone and fallen away and so plenty of the others are going to go the same way fairly shortly so although we had a lot of nuclear stations here, the vast majority of them are either gone completely or will be going again okay, within the just the next few years. So in terms of nuclear power, it's not a big deal in the UK. And unless we're going to start building a huge number of extra ones, it's never going to be a big deal anymore. So at one time it was quite substantial, but those days are pretty much gone. Now in terms of coal stations, uh, we don't use any coal anymore, mainly because there aren't any places to generate it. And uh, the UK had a large number of coal stations back in the 1990s. Today, in 2020, there's actually only four left, all of which are fairly small and relatively insignificant. And of those four, most of those are actually a mark for closure in the next couple of years anyway. And the government's also stated that by 2025, we won't be using coal at all. So coal pretty much has gone. It's not going to be coming back. 
and they say at the moment it's only used in very small amounts very occasionally. So coal, pretty much uh, ancient history. Now in terms of where electricity comes from today and uh, more recently, because that other thing only went up to 2018, we can have a look at this website here now. This is called Drax Electric Insights. This is uh, run by Drax, which is a, uh, or at least was a very large coal power station in North Yorkshire. It's been converted mainly over to burning other things now. And the Drax Group actually operates a whole load of other facilities in the UK as well. Now, this is pretty much near real-time information. This, as it says here, comes from Exxon, the National Grid and Sheffield Solar. There's several of these websites out there. They just all present the same data in various different ways. We use this one because it happens to be the more convenient option. Now, what we're seeing here essentially is from today, which is the 21st of November 2020. Now, I'll see the date here at the top of the screen. And this is actually showing uh, generation or the production of electricity. However, that's pretty much exactly the same as what's being used because the national grid doesn't have any storage of any major capacity at the moment. So generation and usage has to actually match up pretty much exactly. If it doesn't, then the frequency will either fall or increase. And if it increases or falls by even quite a small amount, things will tend to trip out automatically and big chunks of the country don't have any power anymore. So this is pretty much uh, the same thing. Now at the top here in the green, we can see the demand and the price of electricity. The bit in the middle here in the red and blue is the uh, estimated carbon dioxide emissions and also the ambient temperature, although ambient temperature doesn't really change very much uh, along the bottom there, so we'll probably get rid of that. And at the bottom, it shows us the various types of fuels that are used to generate the electricity. Now, the main thing is at the bottom here, the green along the bottom is nuclear power. You can see that's pretty much consistent, basically straight line all the way across. And as we saw in that previous picture, that's uh, basically what you expect there. Nuclear stations are hideously expensive to build and hideously expensive to operate. And you can't just turn off a nuclear reactor for 10 minutes and switch it on again. If you want to turn one off, it could take days to do that. And once you've done that, it could take days or even weeks to switch it on again. So nuclear power pretty much runs at full power all the time, or at least whatever power it can output. So it is pretty much a straight line. Uh, the next one up from that is biomass. This is mainly Drax. Drax power station is basically six uh, different uh, units, all of which used to be coal, but the first four now have been converted to burning biomass, which is primarily wood pellets or wood chips, that type of thing. The other two still do coal, but they're going to be converted to gas and whatever in the next couple of years anyway. Other bits at the bottom there, we've got pump storage. This is another facility which is actually operated by Drax as well. It basically is a big lake on top of a hill full of water. Water can run down the hill through turbines and generate electricity. And at other times when there's an excess of electricity, it can pump the water up the hill and act as a kind of storage. So though it's shown on this graph, it's not actually true generation. And it's quite a small, uh, fairly insignificant item as well. Imports and exports are those generally connected to Europe. And it's we can either send electricity over there or more often we're just buying electricity in from that. Hydroelectricity, again, it's a very, very small and insignificant section. So it's that really thin blue line at the bottom. And then we get to the two big providers, which is this huge blue section here. And you see that is actually wind power, mostly offshore wind. And then this purple bit on the top is natural gas. So we can see that for today, the vast bulk of electricity being generated is coming from wind power. And uh, the rest of it is being topped up by natural gas on the top there. And throughout the day earlier, various bits of that were coming as a biomass and what we're buying in from France and the rest of Europe. Solar is shown there in that tiny yellow bit. The thing about the solar figures here is they are estimates from Sheffield University. There is no central metering of solar, so generally it just results in a reduction in demand around the sort of peak hours. But nevertheless, it's shown in there. But you can see it's fairly insignificant, mainly because it's November. Obviously, it's not a particularly sunny time of the year. Now, have a look at the same information over the last month. So this is from uh, sort of late October 2020 to today, November 2020. You see it's a fairly similar pattern across the board there. Now, we'll notice in the middle here, which is around the sort of 5th to the uh, 10th, 11th of November, the amount of wind power is considerably less. And this is mainly due to there being less wind around that time. And you can see that the total demand fluctuates sort of on a daily basis. But overall, it's remaining fairly consistent throughout there. 
So all that happens is when there's less wind, more gas generation is used to basically fill up the demand there. And conversely, when there's a lot more wind, the amount of gas is reduced. And again, green along the bottom, nuclear power, pretty much a straight line. And then the other things along there as well, nothing uh, really significant. So the big two drivers for these things are wind power and gas. It's either lots of wind and not a lot of gas, or lots of gas and not a lot of wind, I'll say depending on the actual day in question. Now, wind in particular is something which has increased massively over the last few years. Now, this is a month in, say, from October. Now, if we pick a month from the 1st of October, so that will give us the whole of October. Here's the wind in the blue there. Got a bit of a dip there around the sort of middle of October, where presumably less wind. Let's go back five years. So if we go back to 2015, and again, we'll pick the 1st of October. And let's just see what kind of massive difference, if there is one, that we've got. Now this is just five years ago. We can see the amount of wind in the blue there. It is existing, but it's absolutely tiny compared to what we're doing now. Gas is still there in the purple. And the big thing which isn't there today is this grey section along the top, which as you can see there is coal. So in just five years we've basically got rid of all of that coal and replaced it with wind generation. So uh, wind really has had a dramatic impact on where we get our electricity from. If we go back another five years to 2010, again we'll pick the same October, again we can see it's even more dramatic. Wind has pretty much disappeared down at the bottom here, as have things like imports and exports, those have diminished away to very little, mainly due to there not being as much uh, capacity cabling between the UK and other countries. Nuclear is still there, gas is still there in the middle, and again coal is filling up on the top here. So. The main change has been that we've gone from using an excessive amount of coal there, it's roughly a third, to now having wind pretty much replacing coal entirely. And we can see along the top here, there is a little tiny bit of coal used, so back at the beginning of October, sort of one gigawatt or so there. It's zero a lot of the time, 0.24 gigawatts there, so that's less than 1% of uh, use there. A little bit here around the middle of October there when there was considerably less wind, so 0.9 gigawatts. But again, this is tiny little insignificant amounts, 0 0.3, 0 0.6. So coal is really only used when we're absolutely desperate and that's all that there is available, typically at periods of high demand and where there's less wind power. Now wind power in general is increasing dramatically all the time, we've seen the huge increase there. And there's a lot of wind generation still being built and installed. And over the next five to ten years, there's already a huge amount planned to be installed. So this blue area is going to increase dramatically. And that would just eat into things like the gas here. So we'll just end up using less gas and using considerably more wind. Gas won't be going away, of course, because the problem with wind, when it's windy, which is quite a lot of the time, you get plenty of electricity. But as we can see here in the middle of the month there, if you happen to get a period of fairly light or no wind, then you don't get any electricity from it. And of course this is why things like storage are going to become important in the future, because with storage we could use any excess wind generation, store it in say batteries or other mediums there, and use that to fill in demand. But at the moment, say there is pretty much no storage, so it's just a question of turning on more gas generation to fill up the gaps when wind isn't around. Most of this wind, by the way, is offshore. So built off the coast in the sea, primarily the North Sea and that sort of area. And so there's a vast amount there already. And there's a huge and huge amount that's going to be put in, say, just over the next few years. And that's covering stuff that's already been approved and is actually currently under construction. Never mind anything that might be approved and suggested in the future. Now let's have a look at a single day. And this is fairly typical for a single day. If we uh, turn off the price there, we can see at the top here in the grey, the demand. So this goes from pretty much to the midnight. This is actually the 10th of November, which was a Tuesday a couple of weeks ago, sort of a weekday there. So demand at midnight was around 25 gigawatts, just showing on the top there. Fairly flat until we get to uh, sort of around 6 a.m. And the demand starts to climb until we get to uh, sort of uh, 9 a.m. there, and it's increased to around 35, 36 gigawatts. Relatively flat throughout the day. Minor increase there. However, by the time we get to sort of four o'clock in the afternoon, and bearing in mind this is the time when it starts to get dark at this time of year, then demand increases quite considerably. And we get a peak there, in this case around 6 pm, and it's up to around just under 42 gigawatts. 
from there it's pretty much a downhill slope all the way until again we get back down to that uh, thing at midnight around the 25 gigawatts point. And it's important to note that this is actual real generation usage, so the system is perfectly capable of generating that sort of 42 gigawatts or so, and in theory it could do that for the whole day throughout the night as well, if of course there was the demand there to actually need it. And if you look over the seven day picture, it's pretty much the same kind of pattern. So over here on this side is that Tuesday the 10th that we are just looking at there, so the peak there around 6pm on the 10th, data shown at the bottom of the screen there. This is the Wednesday, pretty much the same pattern. The only difference there you see there's a lot more wind on Wednesday, so there's less gas used. Thursday, pretty much the same. Note there's quite a bit more solar, so presumably it was quite a bit more sunny on that day compared to the previous. And again the uh, following day, pretty much the same. That's a Friday. Saturday and Sunday, same pattern, but there's less demand because, again, most businesses generally work throughout the week, though. Not so much these days, but it's still the case that plenty of businesses only work Monday to Friday. So Saturday, Sunday, generally less demand there. And then we're back to Monday, of course, with the same sort of peak there, around that 40, 41 gigawatts and point there. And we can see the wind at the beginning of the week was fairly light, so a lot of gas used, and throughout the rest of the week it was quite considerable. So less gas was used. Now, the effect that uh, gas and wind have has two effects, really. One is on the price of electricity, and the other one is on the CO2 emissions. Now, if we have a look on the top of this thing here, we can see that's the price of electricity in green. This is price on the wholesale market, not what you would pay at your own house. This is in price per megawatt hour. And uh, if we have a look at the beginning of the week there, it's around £36, goes up to that, 23 24 65 36, so it fluctuates massively all over the place. £12 there, that was a pretty low uh, figure. £4.75, so that would be a right old bargain. The reason it's so uh, cheap at that point, have a look at the bottom there, you'll see that it was half past two in the morning where demand was pretty much nothing, or extremely low anyhow. There was a huge amount of wind and uh, almost no gas was used, so there was probably an excess of uh, generation there. And of course no one's using it at 2 in the morning so price goes down and if we look at this peak here you'll see the price was up in the £62 per megawatt hour range. Again that's peak demand and we were using a fair amount of gas and there happened to be a lot of wind. Again there it's around that £60 at the peak so it's all driven by supply and demand as most markets are. Now if I have a look over here again there's that peak of 68 but uh, if we have a look in here we can see that at that particular point, which was uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, again, a huge amount of wind, almost no gas being used. And we can see the top price there on the green line is minus £37 per megawatt hour. So yeah, the price is actually less than zero. So people were being paid to take electricity away because it was far too much electricity being generated for the situation, a huge amount of wind power. And it was just say, well, no one wants to buy it. So basically the price goes negative for a short time. But again, once demand picks up, picks up again to that uh, sort of 50, 60 pounds of price there. And this negative pricing thing does happen quite often, particularly in periods where there's excess wind generation. And because we're going to be increasing the amount of wind generation we have, you can expect to see this kind of event happening more and more often. Now, unfortunately for most people, if the wholesale price of electricity is negative, you don't actually get free electricity at your house because that's not how the system works. However, at least one company does offer a tariff where if the price does go negative, then you can benefit from that in a fairly small way. So it certainly provides some interesting uh, concepts for the future. You do, of course, need a smart meter for that and uh, have the particular tariff from the company which offers it. Now let's have a look at what could happen with electric vehicles now. Electric vehicles, specifically electric cars, are becoming a thing. They've been available for 10 plus years in the UK in any kind of serious fashion. The Nissan Leaf has been out for 10 years. And of course these days there's a considerable range of electric vehicles to choose from. And more recently the government has suggested that they're going to ban the sale of traditional petrol and diesel engined vehicles, or cars at least, from 2030, which is just over nine years away. Now, if you go and look on Twitter or anywhere else, you'll see huge amounts of doom and gloom. Generally, any kind of item that's posted up about electric vehicles will have a massive stack of people, probably the same people, rushing in and saying that electric vehicles are no good and they won't be buying them and they're useless and they 
only drive six miles and after three years you have to throw the batteries away and put new ones in, all of which is complete and utter nonsense. Now, one question of course is where are we going to charge these vehicles from? Because fairly obviously electric vehicles need electricity to charge and all of these stories about doom and gloom and the whole national grid is going to melt and there won't be enough capacity and no one will have electricity left. But is that actually true? So let's have a look. Now we can see the peak here, and bearing in mind this is November, so it's a fairly large peak, around this point here where we've got the uh, sort of peak demand there about 6 p.m. Now if we turn on the demand at the top there, we can see that that peak, it's approximately 42 gigawatts, 41.7 there or so. So say 42 gigawatts is the sort of peak demand. And it's pretty obvious the system is perfectly capable of generating that because it does this pretty much every day. It's just that most of the rest of the time we're generating less because, of course, people are using less. And most notably is this section here, which is representing overnight. So that's about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning from, say, uh, midnight there. And you can see it's a fairly steady decline all the way down. Now, most people with an electric vehicle, certainly if they have parking at home, which is a very large percentage of individuals, will charge their vehicle at home overnight. So you park your car up at the house when you get home, you plug it in, it can then charge up overnight for a certain amount of time, and then when you get home in the morning, of course, it's fully charged, ready for you to go driving wherever you need to go. Now, assuming that we can generate 42 gigawatts just like that with existing infrastructure, so we're not adding any cables or any generation or anything else, how much power could we actually add in to this nighttime period, assuming that people are going to charge their cars overnight? Now, of course, not everybody would charge a car overnight because not everybody has a driveway and various other factors, but a considerable number of people do. So what kind of capacity could we get out of this? So let's assume that it goes from midnight, which is when the sort of lowest point goes, say through to about 6 a.m., so roughly a six-hour period. And we can see that the uh, demand through that period is roughly around 25 gigawatts there, so 25.2 there. 24.23 there, 24.25. So we're looking at a difference between 25 and 42, which we could theoretically generate. So what we're going to say is instead of just turning it down from that point, it's going to be running at sort of peak capacity all through those six hour period, and people would have their charging units set up so they would charge through that period. Now this pattern doesn't particularly change regarding where the power comes from. Now on this particular day, as we can see, it was mostly gas. It was around 50% gas there, some wind at the bottom. That wasn't a particularly windy day. But if we look at, say, another day from the following week, say the next uh, Tuesday there, it's the same pattern. So the peak is still around the 42 gigawatt point or so. The low there is still around that 25, 26 sort of area. The only difference is that wind here was a far more significant part of it. Gas was considerably reduced. So there was about a third was wind power. The rest was gas and the other stuff. And in the night here, wind was over 50% for quite a lot of it. Gas was only around 15 16%. So it doesn't matter whether it's windy or not windy. We've still got the capacity there. It just means we're using more gas or less wind. And, of course, more wind and less gas. So in the end, of course, the power, of course, is there. Now, just because we can, let's just do a basic calculation, seeing what we could theoretically fit into that uh, particular six-hour period. Now, obviously, this is only an estimate, and it uh, assumes a variety of things, but you have to give some sort of illustration. So we saw that the uh, peak generation was around 42 gigawatts. That was peak time. And then overnight, for most of that six-hour period, it was around 25, so call that the low period. So in theory, if we generated 42 gigawatts for the whole of that six-hour period, we would have about 17 gigawatts of spare capacity. And in theory, we could use that to charge up electric vehicles. Now, 17 gigawatts is, of course, for six hours. So 12 by 6, that will give us 102 gigawatt hours of electricity that we could use in that six hour period. So let's just call that, say, 100 gigawatt hours, just to make the other figures somewhat easier. Now, the question is, how much mileage can you get in an electric vehicle or vehicles for that sort of figure. Now, a typical electric vehicle for one kilowatt hour gives you between three and four miles of driving distance. And that's pretty typical for almost all electric cars. It doesn't actually change a huge amount. And as an example, a 
a Nissan Leaf, which has a 40 kilowatt hour battery, fairly small as these things go. A 40 kilowatt hour battery will give you between 120 and 160 miles of driving distance, depending on whether you've got three or four miles per kilowatt hour. So uh, fairly straightforward, and that's pretty much what the range of that vehicle is advertised at and what people get driving it in the real world. Now, of course, it does depend on how you drive and the speed you're doing and whether it's the winter, the summer and all the rest of it, but generally between three and four miles per kilowatt hour is very typical. So let's just pick a figure in the middle there. So let's just go for 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour. Now, of course, that's kilowatt hours, but we have uh, at the top here, we've actually got gigawatt hours. So we need to convert from kilowatt hours to gigawatt hours. And to do this, it's basically multiplying it by 1 million kilowatt hour to the next one up by 1,000 is megawatt hours. And then times 1,000, it goes to, to the gigawatt hours. So multiply by 1 million, which is six zeros. That gives us a total of, uh, instead of 100 gigawatt hours, it's 100 million kilowatt hours of electricity. And we're told we can get, say, about three and a half miles per kilowatt hour. So in terms of mileage, that's 350 million miles of driving. And that's per day, of course. So uh, that's a lot of miles. Now, the question now is, of course, how far do people typically drive in their cars? And of course, this will obviously vary massively. Some people might not drive at all for a particular day. Other people could do hundreds of miles, but really we're looking for the average here because bearing in mind this is across the entire country. Remember one national grid for the entire country there. Now we can find this quite easily. So if we just go to Google and put in average annual mileage in the UK, then we can see here the figure is 7,400. And uh, I think that's pretty typical at the moment. It has actually declined. It says the number of cars per household has risen. So per vehicle, people are obviously driving somewhat less. So uh, 7,400 miles there, generally uh, fairly typical. So if we use that figure there, then we can see that uh, 7,400 miles, and that's per year, remember. Divide that by 365, then we get per day is about 20 miles per day average driving. Now that might seem incredibly low, but that's actually how much it is, because a lot of the days people don't drive at all, Huge numbers of journeys are short, it's just driving to work or school or going to the shops or whatever. And of course people do drive longer distances, but certainly on average they're not doing thousands and thousands of miles a week. It is only that 7,400 miles a year on average. So 20 miles a day, which obviously adds up to that much per year. So the question is how many vehicles are we therefore talking about? So got the figure we had before there, so it's 350 million miles divided by 20 miles on average per vehicle per day that gives us 17 and a half million average daily journeys or to put it another way 17.5 million vehicles or cars in this particular case now, how many vehicles are there in the UK? Is this a large number or a small number or what? So again, we just quickly check that uh, fairly straightforward. So vehicles registered in the UK. So this is from the government site here. So in 2017, there were 37.7 million vehicles licensed for use on the road in Great Britain. And being well, that's vehicles. So that is in fact all vehicles. So it includes things like buses and trucks and all kinds of other stuff. But uh, the majority of vehicles on the road are, of course, cars. So uh, We'll take 37.7. So we said 37.7 million vehicles total. Most of those are going to be cars. Obviously, some are going to be other things, buses and trucks and things. But we could therefore say that roughly 50% of vehicles could therefore be electric cars, assuming our 17.5 million was correct. And that's obviously about 35 uh, million cars in total. So that's 50% of all cars being electric based on the average mileage per day. And bearing in mind that's only charging overnight in that six hour period, so we uh, run at maximum capacity for the whole time. That doesn't include all the rest of the stuff on that graph where we've got obviously the extra parts between, say, 6 pm and midnight in that declining area, or the chunk into the mid morning where the demand is obviously considerably lower as well. 
And again, we have no time to do things like weekend and other periods where demand overall is generally considerably less. So uh, there we go, that's a fairly basic uh, way of doing it. But it really goes to show that uh, rather than doom and gloom because a lot of people buy electric cars, the entire system falls to bits, we have actually got a lot of capacity in the system there. It's just a question of using it at the appropriate times. So that's a look there at where electricity comes from and where it's likely to be coming from in the future, basically wind power. And if you plug in all your electric cars and charge them up, no, the national grid is not going to melt and blow up. There's actually piles of capacity in the existing system. And of course, the existing system is being upgraded and increased all the time. Electricity companies aren't just sitting around and uh, hoping that it's going to go away. Every electricity distributor in the UK has been working on increasing capacity and getting ready for electric vehicles and solar installations and heat pumps and all the rest of it for many years already. So again, there's not really a big disaster coming along. People have been doing a huge amount of work, sort of out of sight as it were, to get ready for all of this stuff. And of course it isn't necessarily easy or particularly cheap, but the reality is it's happening now, been happening for years, and it's going to continue to go on. So the realities are that uh, it's not going to be a big meltdown just because some people decided to buy an electric car. So that's it for this video. Until next time, thanks for watching.